sir, again, we're going to spend this time studying your word, a very important subject, Lord, tonight, on what your word has to say about the judgment. And uh, I just pray that you'll help the word and message to be clear, and we'll be drawn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the judgment. That's what we're going to be talking about. This is kind of a part one. Sabbath will be part two, but you can miss part two and still get what you need, I think. Um, or if you get one of the two, you okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about the judgment itself, and I love this. Have you ever heard this, this statement before? Here's my most fa- one of my more favorite ones. Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, right? One of the most misquoted statements in the Bible because it, it, context is super important. Um, or, or the, you know, the people say, don't judge me. Yeah, but incidentally, I've, I was doing some reading and studying, and I, I came up with a, with a thought. You know what the don't judge me is today? You know what that is? It's the new do what thou wilt. Because honestly, the, when somebody says, don't judge me, or don't, don't judge lest you be judged, you know, use that t- statement. What they're saying is, they're usually doing something that they know not to be okay. And so their response, if somebody says, you know, I don't think that's right, is don't judge me. Well, remember satanic, the satanic Bible, Anton LaVey, they, they, their, their argument and satanism or, or, you know, the occult ideas or even new age ideas is do what thou wilt. Do what feels good. You know, that's, that's honestly, for the, uh, like the younger generation people, for the bulk in the world, even, even people like, I'm, I'm, I would be a Generation X, I guess, and, and I'm a 47-year-old, so 46-year-old, I'm on uh, too much, but like, you go through the last several generations, and it's pretty much, the argument is, don't tell me what to do, I can do what I want, right? Don't judge me. Don't judge me is the way of saying, I can do what I want. Well, I think it's very interesting, because they see this, judge not that you be not judged, that means be quiet and leave me alone. Listen to the rest of the text. Matthew 7, 1. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measures you meet, you shall be measured to you again. So the question I want to have is, will you be judged? When it says, judge not that you be not judged, does that mean you're not going to be judged as long as you don't judge anybody? It's like, hey, you know what? You do what you want. You do what you want. I'll do what I want. Well, I'll just be good. Nobody will judge you. You just come and be what you want to be. No one's going to judge you. And so therefore, no one gets judged. Is that right? No. Listen. With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. In other words, yes, you will be judged, but if you go around condemning people and, and being condescending toward people and passing judgment on people, God says, I'm going to use the same standard that you create to judge you. Not that you're not going to be judged. It's just if you create a standard, he's going to apply that standard. As a matter of fact, he's talking specifically here. You think of the scribes and the Pharisees in his day. God's law, God's word says, here's the standard. And the scribes, the Pharisees, and the religious leaders made God's uh, standards. They they actually added to God's standards. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And the scribes and Pharisees and and the, the Jews at the time added 600 laws on how to keep the Sabbath. And he says, okay, you're making these standards. Remember, Remember they accused, I had a guy tell me one time, Jesus sinned. He broke the Sabbath. I was like, no, he never broke the Sabbath. Yeah, he did. They said he broke the Sabbath. I said, yeah, he never broke the Sabbath according to the law of God, not according to the Bible. He never broke the Sabbath. But the Jews had added laws to the Sabbath, and according to their laws, he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was never a Sabbath breaker. You follow that? And, and so what they had done is they had added laws. They had added laws and rules, and then they said, if you break them, you're breaking the, God's law. And so they were judging people based on their own standards. God says, if you do that, I'm going to judge you based on your standards. Cool. Kind of scary, isn't it? That's why I think we should be very, very liberal when we talk about others and very, very conservative when we talk about ourselves. You understand what I mean by that, right? Judge ourselves harshly, right? Hold ourselves to a high standard and and ask for forgiveness when we mess up. But judge others or bring others to a place where we we give them, you know, we, we base them and say, you know what, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. That's what God wants us to do. Okay, but never, never let down truth, right? So, <clears throat> the judgment. I'm going to read, we're going to go actually to Matthew chapter 12, 36 and 37. We're going to read there real quick, Matthew chapter 12. On over a little bit where we was just at. Um, verse 36, Jesus says, which I think is very interesting, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account thereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Does that sound like you're going to be a judged? Yeah, you're judged regardless, right? So the question is, when does this judgment spoken of by Jesus, when does that take place? How does that look? How does it work? You know, 
When does it happen? You know, there's multitudes of people that, that, that God, one at a time, you know, that people die or whatever, and they, they float off into some place that we found. The biblical, the biblical model doesn't teach this in any way. You start to understand why we have things in the order we have them, right? But there's people that believe, you know, that you die and you float off somewhere, and you come up before this big throne, and there's God standing up there, and here comes Willa up to the front, and, she, and he says, how do you plead? And Willa says, not guilty. He says, play the video, please. And she's like, okay, okay I'm guilty right? That people have an idea, like that's how it goes. You know, each case is brought up. But how does this work? You know, when does the judgment take place? And that's what we're going to try to study through as we move through here, okay? And, you know, some people think, actually has the idea that the judgment took place back at the cross. That was the judgment. There was a judgment that took place then. We'll talk about that later on. But that's not what we're talking about when a general judgment. Now you're going to find some interesting Bible text. I found when I studied this to be very fascinating, honestly, because God's Word gives some very pointed descriptions on when this takes place. Did you know that in the New Testament, in, in the New Testament, you have um, an outline as far as a timeline for when the judgment begins? And then it gets more detail back in the Old Testament. Watch this. Now, listen very carefully. You've read these texts, but listen to what it says. Acts 17, 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Okay, when Paul's speaking in the book of Acts, when they're making this statement, it says, hey, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge, has, a judgment, has the judgment taken place yet, according to him? No, the text says that it'll come a time when he will judge every man, right? So the judgment is yet in the future from the time in the book of Acts. Not just there. Look at this other one. Romans 2.16, Paul writing, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, notice this. It's not saying that there's a judgment one at a time, but he says there's a day when God will judge. You understand there? In other words, there comes a time when this is going to just start taking place. He's going to do this judgment scene. It's, and he says it's still yet in the future from Romans. Notice that the word shall judge puts it yet into the future. No judgment taking place yet. This is after the cross, by the way. Okay, look at the next text. Again, from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30. For we know him that says, vengeance belongs to me, and I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Future tense statement. Not a past tense, not present tense, but future tense. He says there's going to come a time in which he will judge or shall judge his people. Isn't that interesting? Putting the judgment in the future. Now, when did the cross take place? 31 AD, right? We get the cross, okay? From that time, after that, at some point, they're saying still pointing into the future, a judgment's gonna take place. Now look at the next one. Romans 14, 10. Last one we're gonna do this route with. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set it not your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand. In other words, once again, Future tense statement, there's going to come a time when we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's interesting thoughts, isn't it? So all these texts are putting a, a future tense judgment. Let me show you something. I'm going to give you, we're going to do a lot with timelines tonight, right? Showing graphs. Because the Bible gives you timelines without you recognizing it oftentimes. Here's one example. What time, when did the cross take place? 31 AD. And now speaking after the cross, there's many people, these, these Bible texts says that the judgment's going to be sometime after the cross. So it's going to take place sometime after 31 AD. You have a timeline from the biblical record, right? I love Bible study. I love dig digging into the Bible. And sometimes, when you're, especially when you're looking at things prophetically, if God is saying something or has the, has the prophet saying something at a certain time and says this will happen in the future, you know, if you can know when that prophet is writing, you know it's going to be in the future from that time, right? That's why we have the book of Daniel. You remember he get, the book of Daniel we'll look at again in a little bit, but he takes you through time with, with each of the kingdoms. Now, most of us, when you, when you read through the kingdoms, and we, we said, you know, uh, um, Babylon lasted from 605 to 531 B.C., and then, and, and then uh, Medo-Persia lasted from three, 531 to, um, I would say, 539 to, I forgot what it was. It, I'll think of it in a minute. My mind's, not, my, my mind's not working on the dates right now. But it takes you through each time. So finally, you find Rome, which lasted from um, 168 B.C. all the way to, to 436 AD when it was divided up. Remember the feet, it was the, the divisions that takes place. And so basically that gives you a timeline for prophecy. Like if you just started drawing it out, you could say, okay, here's what's going to happen during this time frame in this cycle. Is that making sense? 
because it gets more interesting as we move through. So a future tense judgment yet to take place. So according to the New Testament text we've read so far, we have all these texts putting a judgment in the future. But now there's a very interesting text in the book of Revelation. So if you'll turn with me in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, I want you to notice what, the, what it says takes place here. Okay, we're going to study this just a little bit here. And I saw another angel, <clears throat> now before I even read on, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, okay? And, and somebody, somebody always says, uh, it says, having the everlasting gospel. Well, this isn't God's people preaching. This is an angel preaching, okay? That's why I want to pause here for just a minute. Um, God's using symbolism in the book of Revelation, right? This is the only text in all the Bible where you find a symbol being given as an angel being the one doing the preaching. Everywhere else, even the Great Commission, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, he says, you people right? Go and preach the gospel, the everlasting gospel, into all nations, right? You're doing the preaching. As a matter of fact, in the book of, uh, did I write it down? No, I don't have it in my notes. It's in Peter, where it says angels desire to look into uh, being able to preach the gospel. They want to be able to do that. You can, if you, if you want to challenge me on that, I can look it up, but uh, the text is there in Peter, First Peter, I believe. The reason I bring that up is because the word actually translated here when it says another angel flying in the midst of heaven, that word is translated from a word that in other places in your Bible, it's used as messenger. Speaking of John the Baptist, listen to this. Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read it to you. Matthew chapter 11, because I'm already there. In verse 10, I want you to listen to this. It says, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Speaking of John the Baptist, the word messenger there is the same word here translated angel. Angelos, that's the word right? Translated angel. And again, you find it in Luke chapter 7, 24 to 27, speaking of John the Baptist. It says, remember when the guys, the messengers from John while he's in prison and says, are you the Messiah or should we look for another, right? Well, as, as they left, the Bible says, Matt, or Luke chapter 7, 24 to 27, if you want to write it down, Luke chapter 7, 24 to 27. But it says, after they left, it says, as the messengers of John left, the word messengers, angelos, again, were they angels or were they, mess, were they men? Right? They were men. They were men. John the Baptist had sent them, right? As they left, and then Jesus speaks about John the Baptist, and he said he's one of the, uh, it speaks of him as one of the greatest of the prophets or whatever, and talks about John the Baptist being a messenger, uses the same word once again. Angelos. Was John the Baptist an angel? No, he was a messenger. So you have, depending on context, in the Bible, it's interesting, the word angel, the word angelos, is translated sometimes as messenger, right? And other times it's translated literally as, a, as an angel, an angelic being from heaven, okay? So it, I want to just point that out because it says that this messenger is flying in the midst of heaven or this angel is flying in the midst of heaven. What's he have? The everlasting gospel. I like that, okay? So this everlasting gospel, what's that mean? The same gospel that's always been preached is the gospel that's continuing to be preached. It's the everlasting gospel, right? It doesn't change. To preach to them that dwell upon the earth. Who are the ones hearing this gospel? Those on the earth. Who did God um, say? Who did he tell to preach the gospel to everybody on the earth? The people that believe the gospel, right? Share it with everybody. To every nation, kindred, tongue, that word means language, and people saying with a loud voice. So here you have this message going out to all the world. Remember Jesus says that in Matthew 24, verse 14, that this gospel, this kingdom will go into all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. So in, it, it goes along with, the, with what Jesus has said, how you know about the end of the world. This message is going to go out to all the world, then the end comes. Matthew chapter 28, he tells the disciples, go preach into all the world, and then he's going to come. Here we find, here it is taking place now. This is the book of Revelation. And he says, now John's writing in the book of Revelation, and he says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Now, he's looking into the future. Right? We'll know that from the context. He's looking into the future, and he sees this message going into all the world. Here's the message. With the everlasting gospel saying with a loud voice. So what you're going to read next when it says he's saying the everlasting gospel, what you're reading next is the biblical definition of the everlasting gospel, which is pretty cool. Because, you know, you ask somebody, oh, well, just preach the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Oh, it's Jesus. Okay, give me a biblical textual definition of the gospel. Here it is, right? There's other, there's other scriptures that kind of talk about it very similar as well. But here is the, 
one instance in the Bible where it says, here's the everlasting gospel, and then he begins to say. When it says saying, what's he saying? The everlasting gospel. Fear God. Now, we'll talk about that more another night, but I want you to think about that. The very first thing in the everlasting gospel is a call for the people to reverence God, fear God. And it, it, I, by the way, I looked up that word fear. You know what it means? To be afraid. I've heard people say, oh, it means to reverence. Yes, it carries that meaning, but it means to be afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but I can remember when I was a kid, I was afraid of my dad. Not a fear of like being harmed, not a fear of being, of being he was going to do something bad to me. I mean, I, I knew he loved me, but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of him harming me, but I had a fear of my dad, <laughs> right? That's the wording being used here for this type of fear. I know everybody says, oh, it just means reverence. It doesn't just mean reverence. It means that he is God right? He has the power and authority to wipe you out of existence or save you for eternity. He's the, he is, that's who he is. And it's a call back to worship him as, as to reverence and fear God, which is very interesting when you think of the Christian culture in the bulk of the world at the end of this earth's history, many people think of God as this good old buddy they can sit down and drink a beer with and watch a football game. That's not the God of the Bible. And in spite of what the contemporary Christian culture wants to say, that's not the God of the Bible. So he wants us in, a, in the everlasting gospel to call people back to the God that made everything. This, this God that has the authority and the power. Call him back to that. Moving on. And give him glory. Part of the gospel? Give glory to God. Now we're going to talk about that another night too. Now listen to this part. For the hour of his judgment, what's it say? Is come. Now notice that. We read all those texts a few moments ago that, that, that he's, he's going to judge, he's going to judge, he's going to judge, judge in the future, judgment in the future. But now all of a sudden, John, looking at sometime in the future, says a message is going to go out that says everlasting gospel for the hour of his judgment has or is come. In other words, the judgment has begun as part of the gospel. Now this is prior to the second coming of Jesus. This is prior to the end of the world. This is the message going out to warn people of the end of the world, and it, be, and it has the message in the everlasting gospel that judgment has come, which is very fascinating. I'll tell you what's fascinating about it to me. I spend, I spend time studying, looking into um, even you know, what I think is God's church and other churches. I kind of pay attention to what's being preached and said. Lots of people say, we don't need to be preaching so much on this judgment idea because judgment is scary. You know, you're like, God's going to judge you. You know, better, better behave yourself. God's going to judge you. Part of the everlasting gospel, right from the Bible, is you call people to understand you need to reverence God, fear God, give him glory for the hour of his judgment. The reason being, the reason you reverence God, the reason that you give him glory, it says for, because the hour of his judgment has come. So the whole reason for serving God and living for God and that type of thing is because the judgment is beginning. That's what it says, for or because. Okay, and more about that in detail, but not right now. And worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now, I've had people tell me, you know, you preach a whole lot about law and, 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 and uh, serving and, and being, living righteously and living for God. And, and where's all the, why don't you preach more of the gospel? I've had people tell me that. You don't really preach the gospel. You preach about judgment and law and Sabbath. And why not preach the gospel? And I was like, you know, I preached the same gospel that Paul preached. I'm going to show you that in a moment. I preached the same gospel that the Bible says to preach. We, this, this church actually is, honestly, one of the reasons I became, came into this movement, I want to say, is because it's the only place you really find the true everlasting gospel in general, for, for most parts, being preached right out of the Bible. It gives you a reason for your faith. My reason is for Jesus Christ. He saved me from my sins. Well, what's your sins? Well, the sins are transgression of the law. You know, you do the whole process, right? This is the only place you find everything fitting. Here's the everlasting gospel being preached, and it says to call people back to the fact that judgment has begun. So we found out that there's a future tense, future tense, future tense judgment. John, looking into the future right before Jesus comes, sometime before, he says now the judgment has begun. So let me ask you a question. From the biblical text we've looked at so far, does the judgment begin sometime after the cross, but before Jesus comes? It sure does. Now, I'm going to show you real quick that we're preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. In your Bible, let's go to Acts 24, 24. Acts 24, 24. This is one of the best texts. And, and honestly, if you go to Acts chapter 17, remember Paul preaching on Mars Hill to the, to the people at Corinth? Remember that? The Greeks? Remember Paul preaching there at Mars Hill? And it says they were worshiping the unknown God 
Paul begins his sermon by saying, the God that made heavens and earth and all your stuff, he made everything. What was he doing? Preaching to them about the God that made heaven, earth, and sea and fountains of waters. He was preaching this everlasting gospel even to those people. The message doesn't change. It's a call to everyone to worship the true God of heaven the way he wants to be worshiped. What do we learn from all our messages that we've been going through? It's, it's replete throughout the whole Bible. God wants our worship. Satan wants our worship. We've got to choose who we're going to worship, right? If we don't worship God the way he wants worship by default, I know you don't like to hear it, we're worshiping the devil. Now, we're not, that, worshiping the devil doesn't always mean, you know, like, you're, like people frolicking around, acting crazy. You can be worshiping the devil by not worshiping God. Is that making sense? So now I want you to look at this. Paul preaching. Now, here's what's going on in Acts chapter 24. Paul has been in prison, kind of have a respite from the Jews while he's in prison, and he's still preaching to people. And Felix, the governor, whose wife is Jewish, wants to hear what Paul's preaching about. So he calls Paul in to preach to him. And listen to how it goes on. 24, 24. After certain days, when Felix, with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. What's the sermon title? Faith in Christ. Bulletin information there. Faith in Christ, okay? And it says, he, Paul, reasoned. Now, when you read a word that says he reasoned, it means what you're reading next is not his sermon, but what his sermon was about. He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and a judgment to come. Paul is preaching. He has the opportunity to preach this to this Gentile, non-Christian ruler. And the message he preaches to him is about righteousness and temperance and a judgment to come. Now, I picture it something like this. Can I give you my, from, because it says that's what he preached about. I'm going to give you my rundown of what Paul's preaching based on the everlasting gospel, right? Felix, it's your sins, your unrighteousness that put Jesus Christ on the cross. It's your intemperance. It's the way you're living your life, not being temperate. By the way, glorify God. Give God glory. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's, it's talking about temperance right in the gospel there, right? Paul is preaching the everlasting gospel to Felix. Felix, it's your unrighteousness. It's your sins that put Jesus Christ on the cross. It's your intemperance that's put him on the cross. Felix, you're the one guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. This same Jesus, by the way, Felix, is going to be your judge in the judgment. And it says Felix trembled. Read it in your Bible. He says he trembled and said, go thy way. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Now, no one's going to tremble if Paul stands up and says, hey, Felix, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. That's not what was said, right? He reasoned to him about these things. He preached a message to bring guilt to Felix. He preached a message that says, you're guilty of the blood of Christ. He put guilt on him to where he realized, I'm a lost man. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he calls him to this judgment scene that's going to take place and causes him to, to point him to Christ. He'll be either your advocate or, or your condemner in this judgment that, that's going to take place. Now, my friends, I don't think Paul would preach that message today. I don't think he would preach. I think Paul would preach righteousness and temperance and the judgment has come. We're going to go through a study tonight as we continue through this, and we're going to find out that this judgment scene has begun. John said it would happen. The message would go out before Jesus comes that the judgment has begun. Our judgment has come. Do you see that there? So now let's look at this again on the screen. 31 AD, after the cross, John is writing. Judgment sometime after the cross. So the question is not, will I be judged? The question is, when will I be judged? Now, if we don't go any farther, has anybody learned anything tonight? Pretty interesting, isn't it? That's New Testament. The Old Testament nails it down for us. Now, y'all remember when we studied Daniel chapter 7? And we went through those beasts that gave us a timeline of beasts, right? Of kingdoms as they run along. We skipped over a whole segment. Somebody asked me about that. It's like, why did you skip this segment? We're going to answer that tonight. We're going to go back to that segment. So let's watch this now. Begins sometime um, and ends sometime after the second coming. So this judgment begins and ends sometimes after the second coming. Now we're going to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to give a quick rundown of Daniel 7, okay? So let's all turn there because it's going to be on the screen, not the text, though. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, then Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel the seventh chapter. Now you remember it began, John had a bit, or Daniel had a vision. And what's he see first? The winds and the waves roaring and he representing these kingdoms all fighting, you know, the, the nations all fighting. And then a kingdom comes up, rises up, and that was the kingdom of 
Babylon, remember the lion with eagle's wings? And Babylon lasted from 605 to 539 BC, right? And then another kingdom rises up in the form. Now, by the way, if you haven't studied this and don't know this, you just have to believe me on this. We've already had a study to show all these things. I'm not going to prove it again right now. That's uh, some foundational stuff, okay? So then the, after the lion goes away, same as in Daniel 2, you had chest and arms of silver. You had the bear with the rib, three ribs in its mouth. Remember, it conquered Babylon, Medo-Persia, Medo I mean, Babylon, uh, Lydia, and Egypt to become the world-dominating power. Medo-Persia did, right? So they come, they, they comes into power, this bear raised up on one side from 539 to 331 BC. It's taking us down through a timeline. And then Greece comes on the scene in 331 BC with a, with a four-headed leopard and four wings or the belly and thigh of brass in Daniel 2. Greece comes on the scene in this timeline, and uh, it lasts from 331 to 168 B.C. I think it was the Battle of Pydna. Rome takes over, okay? Rome takes over in 168 B.C., and it's represented with the legs of iron or this, or this dragon-like beast that's given in Daniel chapter 7, this nondescript beast, nothing in the zoo compared to, and it comes on the scene, 168 B.C., runs all the way to 476 A.D. when it's divided, which is interesting because you get over here into the... To Daniel chapter 2, it had went in the feet and toes. Remember the 10 toes? And then it's, this beast has how many horns? 10 horns, right? And, it, and it's, it says it's the divisions of that Roman empire. The Rome was divided up, 476. That's where it was all divided up at. And then in Daniel chapter 7, God added detail. Because it says after those horns are divided up, a little horn would come up to power. It, it, it would uproot three. The Vandals, the Herulian, the Ostrogoths were uprooted as the Roman church comes to political power in 538 A.D. And then Rome lasts, 538 A.D., the, the little horn, 538 A.D., it gives that prophecy of the 1260 years, takes you all the way down to 1798 when it received a deadly wound. How did that happen? Remember Napoleon, the general Napoleon, trying to conquer the world, right? And he says to his um, birthier, hey, I need you to go up there and take that guy off, the, off his throne. So he does. And Pope Pius VI is captured, dies in captivity, and to all intents and purposes, the papacy was dead, 1798. Now, it, the book of Revelation says that he receives that deadly wound, but his deadly wound is ultimately healed, and all the world wonders after, which is what we're doing today. But now the reason I bring that up, it gives you a timeline here. This timeline lasts, let me put it up on the screen this way. The, um, the idea is, well, where's it at? Here we go. You had Babylon. Come on, Medo Persia. Greece. Rome. Rome divided. Little horn. Judgment is the next thing we read. How do we know that? Let's go now to Daniel 7, and I want you to see what happens. Daniel chapter 7, if you go down to verse 8, everybody with me? I need you in your Bibles because it's not going to be on the screen. Daniel 7, 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Before him three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, a mouth speaking great things. It's the Antichrist power. Look at your next part of the verse. This is the part we skipped, but it continues in the, ver in the dream. I beheld till thrones were cast down. That's the King James. Thrones were cast down. Um... Anybody have another translation? Any other translation at all out there? Anybody? What's it say in yours right there? Exactly right. Is that New King James? Yeah. She, it says, and the King James is the one place because it sounds confusing. When it says thrones were cast down, sounds like you're overturning kingdoms, doesn't it? But what it really literally would translate as, in the, in the King James, it, it, mean, it's, it means the same, but it's, our language is different now. I beheld till thrones were set in place. In other words, a throne was set up. That's what he's saying. I, I beheld until I saw a throne set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. Right? So what John's seeing, he sees these kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided, little horn rising up. And then he says, I beheld until I saw a throne set up, and the Ancient of Days came and sat down on the throne. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father. Anybody here ever been to a court setting? All rise. Judge comes in, sits down on his throne. Everybody sits down and judgment starts, right? Now watch this. I beheld the thrones were cast down or set in place, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, his hair of head pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, his wheels of the burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now listen to this. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. What is going on at that point? Ancient days comes in and sits down on his throne. All right? The judgment begins and the books are opened. What books are being opened? Have you heard of the book of life? 
The book of remembrance? There's books in, that, that talk about the Bible, right? So what's going on here? What, how would you picture this? The judgment begins and the books were open. Now, I'm going to give you a quick rundown. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Who was ruling when Jesus was on the scene? Rome. Who was ruling when John was writing the book of Revelation? Rome. John in the book of Revelation says, I saw in the future a judgment begin. Daniel goes through a list. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided. Still Rome is there, right? Rome divided. And then he says, and then I saw in heaven, the ancient of days took a seat and judgment begins. Does that fit the New Testament timeline so far? New Testament timeline says sometime after Rome, judgment begins. Daniel gives you a timeline at the beginning of the judgment. Little horn, then the judgment. And then what we read later, just a little bit past that, after the judgment is the second coming. Look at this. In Daniel chapter 7, it says, I beheld, um, verse, verse 11 now, judgment is starting, verse 11, I beheld then because of the great words which the little horn spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So John watches it all the way to the end till ultimately it, the beast is destroyed, right? That's what it says. But now he's going to back up again. He says, as concerning the rest of the beast, who are the rest of the beasts? You have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, the, lo the lion, the bear, the leopard, the nondescript. As concerning the rest of them, listen to what it says. They had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I, I, I remember trying to read this, follow this through and, and say, what, what is this talking about? And I studied commentaries and spent some time on this. It's very interesting. Think about this. When Babylon was destroyed... Did Babylon ideology and theology go away? Why, no. As a matter of fact, Medo-Persia incorporated much of Babylonian ideology and theology and way of life into their system because not all the Babylonians were just wiped out off the place. They didn't drop a nuke on them and just, they're gone. And so their culture was incorporated, the way they've done things, and actually ended up being incorporated into Medo-Persian or Persian theology and ideology, right? So that beast, even though his kingdom was taken away, his dominion, his dominion was taken away, he continued, right? Now, think about this as we move on. The next kingdom comes along, Greece. When they conquered Medo-Persia, did all Babylonian and Medo-Persia or Persian ideology and theology, did it all just go wipe off the scene? Or did it get incorporated in Greek mythology? Right? So the Greeks then have, they have a combination of Babylonian ideas and Persian ideas and their own ideas and all kinds that go together. So he's saying here, now just stay with me, as concerning the rest, they had their dominion taken away. They weren't ruling anymore, but their lives were prolonged. They continued. And by the time you get to the Roman emperors, you have a, you have a conflagration, if you will. Did I say that right? That's the right wording, isn't it? You had this whole grouping together of Babylon ideology, Medo-Persian theology, and, and Greek mythology and ideology, all incorporated into what they called Babylon, which is very, or I mean, uh, Rome, which is very interesting because Rome actually ends up becoming the Roman church, which is a combination of all these ideologies and theologies in one system. The sun worship, remember the woman holding the cup with the sun coming out of it? Babylonian ideas that, that were sun worshipers, you know? And you, you just have all this com combined together. How do I know that's absolutely true? In the gospel, I mean, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, John sees that beast coming up, naming every one of these beasts amalgamated into one beast. Right? He says, I saw this nondescript beast come up out of the water. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. I saw this, I saw this just this this dragon-like beast come up out of the water. It had, it had the body of a leopard. It had the feet of a bear. It had the mouth of a lion. He names the exact animals that Daniel names in this prophecy in reverse order. Of course, John's on this side looking in reverse, and he names the same animals being amalgamated into one beast in reverse order. In other words, what he's saying is, even though all their dominions were taken away, they were still alive. So you read this right here, and Daniel's saying the same thing. Concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, but their lives are prolonged. You actually finally come to a, a, a kingdom or a power that has an amalgamation of all those ideas and theologies wrapped up into one beast. Isn't that powerful? So he's seeing this, okay? Then it goes on. I saw in the night visions. So Daniel now, he's still in vision. He's still, still seeing symbols. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. What is that describing? Very plainly, that's describing Jesus coming in before the Father in the judgment. Some people say, that's him coming. No, it's not him coming, because I want you to notice what it says. In the night visions, one like the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus. He refers to himself as the Son of Man, right? 
He comes with the clouds, and incidentally, it's clouds of angels, many angels, another study of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. So who, where's the Ancient of Days at when this is happening? Where's he at? Sitting on his throne, right? He's sitting on his throne, all the angels around, and now they're bringing Jesus in before him. What for? This is the judgment. Remember it just said the judgment had begun? Can you picture the scene? Now, in the judgment, if you're a follower and a faithful Christian, if you're a follower of God, who is your advocate? Jesus, what's happening here? You're coming up in the judgment. Jesus is coming before the Father. Your name's going to come up. I always love this. People actually have this idea that when we, when, since we all have to go before God in judgment, that we're all going to go through that one at a time. And we've already kind of illustrated this with Willa. What would you say? I mean, the very moment you said not guilty, you just lied. You're, we're all guilty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way you can get out of the judgment by being and safely is if Christ is your advocate. Do you have to be physically there for your name to come up in the judgment? You need Christ physically there for you in the judgment, right? If you go before, if you go for yourself, you're doomed. <laughs> I always read that. I read that thing. A, a man who is an attorney for himself has a fool for a client. No one got that, <laughs> right? You get that, right? If you go to try to defend yourself before God, you, you're, and you're, the, you're your own attorney, you're a, your client's a fool. You need Christ for your attorney, okay? Now, look at that. So, oh, back to the scene. So here's Jesus coming for him in judgment. Now, look at the next one, verse 14. Back to the Bible. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion everlasting, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that will not be destroyed. What's that referring to? When does Jesus receive a kingdom that lasts forever and never goes away? When does he receive that? Second coming. Isn't that something? So you have an order of events. Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided, little horn, judgment, second coming. Now, some people read that and they're like, ah, that's, you're kind of stretching a little bit. That's fine. This gets repeated no less than two more times in Daniel chapter 7, the same order of events. If God gives you an order of events, one, probably want you to know it, right? If he gives it to you twice, probably should pay attention. If he gives you the same order of events three times in the same chapter, do you think we should pay attention to it? Absolutely. So let's look at this. How does this go on? So here's the, here's the timeline. Remember, 31 AD, New Testament, sometime after the judgment, after the cross, begins and ends before the second coming. So the judgment takes place, begins and ends before the second coming. We'll show that moving on. So look at this. Daniel 7's timeline. Cross in 31 AD, time of Rome. Little horn comes up after that cross. Then the, the, he receives his wound, and then he says judgment after that. So according to your Bible, both New Testament and Old Testament Daniel 7, we find that the judgment must then take place sometime after Rome's little horn receives its wound. After the horn, judgment. That's what we just learned, learned there, right? So sometime after 1798, there's a judgment that takes place. Now, most of you that have studied this, you know, I said, if I said to you, we're going to study a, a Bible study on the time of the judgment, what text would most of us turn to? Does anybody know? Daniel 8. 14, under 2,300 days, and thousand shanks for every cleanse, right? Well, you go to that. Look, you can take that. It, don't do this, but you can take that and rip it right out of your Bible. You can go right from the New Testament to Daniel chapter 7 and prove a judgment takes place sometime after 1798. Is that making sense? God gives a timeline. He lays it out there. Little horn receives his deadly wound at 1798. That's the 1,260 years. After that, judgment begins. Now, you don't look totally convinced, but that's okay. We're going to find out that we'll be judged anyway. Go with me back to Daniel 7, and let's read on down. After verse 14, verse 15, it says, I was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of them that stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. He says this, verse 17, these great beasts, which, you, which are four, are four kings that arise out of the earth, four kingdoms. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. There's a quick rundown of the whole scenario. The kingdoms will arise. But ultimately, God's people last forever, right? Verse 19, Daniel's not satisfied with that answer. He says, I want to know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different from all the other beasts, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, its nails of brass, which devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped the residue with its feet, and of the ten horns that were in its head, and of the other which came up, the little horn, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, okay? So he says, I want to know specifically about the fourth beast, even more specifically about that little horn. Is that what you read there from Daniel? 
So what's he, is he ask, he's asking a question to the, to the, in the vision, to the angel. Hey, tell me about that little horn. Look at the answer. Verse 21, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. When was the little horn making war with the saints? We call that the dark ages, right? Remember during, through that time frame when he had power to have control over men, control over people, taking the Bible away, making war against God's people? And it says, until, so he's making war against the saints until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and then the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So now follow that timeline. He says, I saw the horn making war with the saints. Then he says, until the ancient of days came. When did, what did the ancient of days come and do there according to the text? Took his seat, and the judgment begins. And it says, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and then they possessed the kingdom. So you have little horn fighting against God's people, judgment, and then the saints possess the kingdom. Little horn, judgment, all the way to the end of the timeline, saints will possess the kingdom. Second coming of Jesus, sometime out in the future, right? Isn't that neat? Go back to the text. He's going to repeat it again. Wonderful. You just, when you read through this, sometimes it just, it, it, I don't know if it is for you right now, but isn't it like very plain? He's giving this order again. Watch what he says. Verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Verse 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Another will arise after them. He'll be different from the first. He'll subdue three kings. All right, so here's that little horn again. He's going back to the little horn. He subdues the three, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. He'll wear out the saints of the Most High. What's going on? We're repeating the same scenario again, right? He's fighting against God's people. He'll... And it says, and he'll think to change times and laws. He's working, doing his thing. They, he'll be given unto his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. Remember, you look at that, that time, time, dividing of time is three and a half years, 1,260 days, or, or day for year principle, 1,260 literal years. We, it's a study we do. We, we're going to do it more detail even again another night, but that's the idea. So now he sees a little horn through the 1,260 years. You follow that in the text? Look at the next verse. This is the slam dunk. Verse 25, the bottom part, until a time, times, and dividing of time, but the judgment shall sit. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about that once again. He says, little horn's fighting against the saints, little horn's doing this, little horn lasts from 1,260 years, but then, what's the next verse he says? What's he say? Judgment. All this happens, then the judgment. So we found it back in Daniel 7, back in verse 10 and 11, right? All this is happening, little horn, judgment. Then, then the saints receive the kingdom. Judgment, then second coming, right? Now, look at this. Verse 26, the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it until the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. What just happened? Yeah, exact second coming. Exactly. Some, uh, one person I saw was shaking her head and they got it. Praise the Lord, right? I think everybody else got it too. Just one person was excited to see it. Isn't it exciting to see that though? So think about it. Little horn, judgment, second coming. Three times in the same chapter. Isn't it exciting? If you take it back to the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, everlasting gospel is being preached into the future from John's day, who's living right before the time frame of the little horn coming up, you know, just a few hundred years before, four or five, four, four hundred years or whatever before, right? But he's living in like the latter part of his life, and he's looking in the future, and he says sometime into the future, there's going to be this gospel going out and saying the hour of his judgment has begun. Daniel looking in the future, he says, yeah, I see it, I see it. You have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided, little horn rises up, he lasts for a certain time, and then a judgment takes place, and then Jesus comes and the saints possess the kingdom. That's the order of events for the end of the world. Quite simple, isn't it? I mean, I've heard all kinds of expositors on TV and things like that, and they get these big, long, drawn out, trying to explain all the details of the scenario. God said it's very simple. Here's how it's going to work. Hang on, because you're living in the time of the end. Think about it. As you follow this pattern, where are we living at? We live in Babylon? Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided, little horn, little horn to have a de deadly wound, the wound being healed, judgment, then second coming. We're right at the end of that time frame. Like you are at the end of time with all the biblical time frames given. That's the exciting time to be alive. So the question is not will you be judged? 
The question is when? Now, we're going to have a part two on this eventually, okay? Uh, Sabbath, actually, <laughs> Saturday. You, you want to be here for that, right? We're going we're to do this a little bit more right now, setting the stage for the next phase of this study, okay? Um, to give an idea, we're going to go on now to a chapter we missed the other night, Daniel chapter 8, okay? So go with me to Daniel chapter 8 for a moment. Daniel, the eighth chapter, we're going to see this scenario taking place once again, okay? Daniel 8, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Now, Daniel 2 began with what kingdom? Babylon. Daniel, Daniel 7 began with what kingdom? Babylon. Daniel 8 is going to begin again, but it's going to skip over Babylon. We're going to try to find out why, and it's going to have the same scenario we just looked at. Watch this. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, who is King Belshazzar? Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So who's ruling? What kingdom's ruling? Babylon. A vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan, in the palace, which is in the providence of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. When I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. Now the two horns were high, but the higher come up, the, uh, the, t the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher come up last. So he sees this ram with two horns, right? They're really tall horns. One's higher than the other, but the higher one come up last. Now you keep in mind, uh, I'll, just leave, I'll just leave it at that for right now. We'll just keep, leave it at that. Let's read, let's read the next verse. The ram was pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and he became, what's the word? Great, just keep that in mind. Actually, in your Bible, if you want to, highlight he became great. It, it'll be important before we're done here, okay? So this ram becomes great. Now, who is this ram? Oh, it's very simple. Because in your Bible, just look at verse 20. The ram which you saw having two horns are Medo-Persia. <laughs> All right? You don't have to be a Bible expositor, a deep, a deep theologian to figure that one out, right? The ram, according to the Bible, is who? Medo-Persia. Now, so this, this vision that Daniel has begins with what kingdom? Medo-Persia. Why, uh, why doesn't it begin with Babylon like the others? Now, some people say Babylon's on their way up. That's not why I don't think it was. Babylon's still there. Babylon was on its way out. Even, even in Daniel 7, Babylon was technically on its way out, right? And, and that's a good answer. And I, I like that one okay, but there's even a better answer. In Daniel chapter 8, we're going to study it again later. In Daniel chapter 8, there's a time prophecy given. The time prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 begins during the time of Medo-Persia. Okay? So now think about it. If God's going to give a time prophecy there, and the time prophecy begins under Medo-Persia, but he begins his prophecy talking about Babylon, can you understand some confusion? Like somebody's going to say, no, 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 you can't say that's going to start in Medo-Persia because the prophecy actually that he gives there begins with Babylon. So he skips over Babylon, begins with Medo-Persia, and then a few verses later, when we get down to about verse 14, he starts giving a time prophecy, and we're going to find that time prophecy he gives begins during the, the Medo-Persian Empire rule, the beginning of the time prophecy. He'll give us that starting time. Is that making sense? So yeah, Babylon's on its way out. Good answer. And then that's, that's the typical one we have. Nothing wrong with it. But keep in mind, the time prophecy begins under Medo-Persia. Okay? Now let's move on. Verse 5. I was considering, the be I was considering behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, did not touch the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had the two horns, and which I had seen standing before the river, you, the river, and ran unto him with the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with, the King James says, choler. I don't know why he uses that term. Indignation, hatred against him. He smote the ram, broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But... He cast him to, down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the goat waxed how? Very great. No, 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 very great. Remember, the ram was, the, the, uh, the ram was great. The goat is very great. Okay, now, this is important, by the way. This is, so how, I mean, you want to highlight that maybe in your Bible or underline it. Very great. He became very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken off, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Oh, interesting, right? So now you have this, you have this, after the ram, you have this goat that rises up, and the goat is so powerful, so fast, he's not even touching the ground, which is interesting because it, it grease, remember, and it correlates to the, the left four wings in Daniel chapter 7. How do we know this is grease? Now watch this. This is so good. 
Verse 21 of the same chapter. The rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. Who was that first king? Alexander the Great. Isn't that good? And it says, then he's broken off. Now, verse 22. And now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. So basically what takes place is whenever Alexander the Great, he's, he's getting ready to, um, he was drinking himself to death, what he was doing, right? He was dying. He was getting ready to die. The great horn's getting ready to be broken off. And, it, and they're saying, who's going to rule in your place? Because he had four generals, right? And all four generals were pretty well-to-do guys. They were, they were pretty um, um, ambitious, if you will. Who's going to rule in your place? And he says, the strongest. Now, their names were Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. The Seleucid Empire you've heard of, right? And so all four of those generals says, I'm the strongest, I'll rule. And I want you to notice there what it said would happen. The, fir, the, the main king, the first horn, is broken off. And it says, that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, Four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. In other words, these four combined will not be nearly as powerful as the great horn. So Greece, basically what happened, Greece had four, four rulers, four heads. Still Greece, but it was the four heads. Okay. Now, with that part done, what takes place next? We're building up to the same thing here. Okay. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, it says, Out of one of them came forth a little horn. Okay. So now out of them came forth a little horn which wax exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. All right, now, I've got to show you something here. Some people will read this. I'll ask you the question first, and I'll show it to you from the Bible. When it says in verse 9, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, what is the them referring to? Does anybody know? Yeah, you, think, you would think the four horns, don't you? That's what it sounds like, but it's not, and you can prove that from the Bible. Um, let me do it this way first. If I said, um, ah, I had to write, well, let, let's just go on this way first. Let me, let me show you this. In the Bible, or in, the, in Hebrew language, you have masculine and feminine nouns. Like, uh, we don't have that. Like, in English, um, we use, like, her and him to separate. Like, but in Spanish, I'll say, you say, um, if I say something like, la casa, the, that's the house, casa is house. He has the on the end of it. That's a feminine noun, right? Feminine. The house is, it's a feminine word, okay? Um, if I say el nino, that means little boys. Here, here the O on the end, O, el nino. La nina is a, is a feminine. It's a little girl. So you say la nina, it's a little girl. Nino is a little boy, all right? The, the Hebrew has the same thing. Now, the reason I bring that up, because I want you to see something here. Listen to this. The word them and the word wins are both masculine words. The word horns are feminine. Now, some people might not follow this at first, but let, just follow this, okay? So in verse 9, when it says, out of one of them, the word them is a masculine word. Came forth a little horn, okay? The word horn is a feminine. So just before that, when it says, therefore the, great, the, the goat wax very great, verse 8, and when he was strong, a great horn was broken, and for it came four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven, the word them in verse 9, out of one of them, is referring to the winds, not the horns. Because winds and them are both feminine. You can't say, like, let me do it in Spanish, help make it simple for you. You can't say, la nino, or el nina. El is masculine, la is feminine. So la, the, when you say la, the, if you use the word la, it always has to go with a feminine noun. Like, I'm going to say the woman, la, or the little girl, or whatever, la nina. You understand how that works? You couldn't say el nina, because it's a masculine, what is the? Is it, is it adjective? No, what is that? Article, okay, the, see, I'm not very good at English, I failed. Um, so the, right, in, in, the, in the Spanish, the word the, el, has to be with a masculine word, okay? You can't use El Nina, because that's a masculine with a feminine. Same thing in the Hebrew. Now, the reason I bring that out is because some people say, oh, oh, this little horn that rises up, it comes out of one of the four horns of uh, the division of Greece, like the, uh, Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, um, Seleucid. It comes out of one of those four horns. That's not how the Bible describes it. It comes out of the one of the winds. What is winds in the Bible? It's war and strife. So, so what he sees here is that now, now these four are divided up. Now there's a war going on, a commotion taking place, and out of one of them comes forth a little horn. Now look at this little horn with me. Verse 9, out of one of them came forth a little horn, out of the, out of the commotion, which waxed 
exceedingly great. Now, I'm doing this because some people say this little horn here is Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the Seleucid emperors that, that sacrificed the pig on the altar there, and that he was the Antichrist of this, of this Daniel chapter 8. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Because he didn't come out of one of the horns, he came out of one of the winds, and it says he waxed how? Exceeding great. Now, prior to me mentioning it here, how many people here have never heard of Antiochus Epiphanes, never heard of him before? Okay, how, a lot of hands going up here for the cameras, right? How many people here have never heard of Alexander the Great, never heard of him before? Raise your hand. Okay, the reason I say that, now look at this again. Back in Daniel chapter 8, verse 4, the ram became great. Medo-Persia, they were great. Verse 8, the, wo the goat waxed very great. You heard of Greece. Verse 9, this little horn that rises up, becomes exceedingly great. In other words, compared to Alexander the Great, this horn is exceedingly great. Was Antiochus Epiphanes exceedingly great compared to Alexander the Great? Never heard of the guy. I can tell you a story about him. He's like, he was like, went off into, hit, into nobodiness, right, in a real quick time. But had everybody here ever heard of the papacy? <laughs> the, the Roman church pope, right? Yeah, of course we've heard of that system. And so it becomes exceedingly great compared to Alexander the Great. Okay, we're talking about the same timeline. And he went toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Now, on a, on a, like a plane, if, you're, if this guy's conquering now, this little horn's conquering, he's going to the south, the east, and toward the pleasant land, toward, toward Jerusalem, right? Is that's, that's that a vertical or horizontal conquering? It's horizontal. Now, understand there's two, pa there's two phases of the Roman Empire. There's two phases of Rome. I mean, this, this little horn is Rome, actually. I'm sorry, I, I messed up there. There's two phases of Rome. Rome, in everything we've seen here, has two phases. First, it's the pagan Roman Empire. The Caesar's ruling, right? Remember in Daniel chapter 2, the legs were made of iron, but the feet were made of what? Iron and clay. So in some form, now think about this. In Daniel chapter 2, the legs were made of iron, which represented Rome. The feet were made of iron and clay, which shows that Rome is still in the feet when the image gets hit on the feet and Jesus comes. So Rome, in some form, even according to Daniel 2, lasts all the way to the end of time. Everybody understand that? So the feet were, the legs were of iron, the feet were of iron and clay, and the kingdom gets hit down here. Here we find this little horn, right? And at first he's conquering how? Horizontally, like this, right? Conquering the world. That's pagan phase. But watch his phase change in the next verse. Look what happens in the next verse. Oh, man, I'm just, I'll just read out the Bible. And it waxed great, verse 10, even to the host of heaven. Now which direction is he trying to conquer? Uh, yeah, trying to, so, so here you find both phases. You find the, the pagan phase trying to conquer the world, and then he turns his sights upon God because all that Roman, Roman I'm going to say it this way, Roman churchism is, Roman Catholicism in, in general, the system, is nothing more than the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire turning their views from the earth to try to be in God's place. And you find that here. First he's conquering horizontally, and then he starts to conquer, try to conquer God. And look what it says. And he waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it, came, and, and, and it cast some of the hosts and stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yeah, verse 11, listen to verse 11 very plainly. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Now, who is it that magnified himself even to the, who's the prince of the host? Christ, right? He's the prince, right? And he magnifies himself even to that place. Who done that? That's the Roman church system, right? I will be like the most high. Remember, we studied that he's in a man of sin that puts himself in the place of God, showing himself that he is God. All the reformers said this is who it was, okay? So now he magnifies himself to the prince of the host, and by him, this is so interesting, and by him, the daily sacrifice, is what it says in your, in your thing, by him, the daily um, sacrifice, now let me try it one more time. Got to calm down. Verse 12. And a host was given to him, uh, nope, back, back to verse 11, okay. Yea, he magnified himself, even the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. You notice the word, by the way, there in your Bible, sacrifice, is italicized? You know what it means when you're reading your Bible and the word's italicized? It means it's not there. They just added it for clarity. Now, you can leave it, fine, it doesn't hurt anything, but it says the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Hey, now, this, this, is, this is quite interesting for me. I'm going to get that off there for a minute. Let's move forward. There. Now you can't see it. Okay? And, and so it says the daily was cast um, down. Now, what is the whole focus of the Bible, by the way? It's basically trying to get you and I saved. Redemption. The redemption of man. In the Old Testament times, 
if you sin, how do you get your sins forgiven? Yeah, you'd kill an animal and you go to the priest and you kill an animal, right? And, and, and they would go through the process of sacrificing for, for your sins and get forgiven. Now, in the New Testament, how do you get your sins forgiven? You, you pray and ask your high priest Christ for forgiveness of your sins, right? You go to him for forgiveness. Now, when this here says, daily, he would cast the daily to the ground. In the Old Testament, daily, your sins were forgiven by sacrificing the animal. In the New Testament, how are your sins forgiven? You daily, if you have sins, you go to Christ. How would he take the daily away? He would take the daily away by saying, you don't go to Christ, you come to me. Are you following that? So what, what does the system say? The system says, the Roman system says, if you want to give forgiveness of your sins, you don't pray to Christ, you come to us. And we'll tell you. Remember that? By him, the daily was taken away, and, he, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. God has a sanctuary, doesn't he? In heaven, and it's cast down. Verse 12, a host was given against him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast true to the ground and practiced and prospered. So it says that by him, the daily is taken away, and he cast truth, truth to the ground and prospers. Okay? So now they're saying, they say, what he'd be saying is you don't go to the God for forgiveness of sins, you come to us. He's taking God's place, casting the truth to the ground, casting down God's sanctuary. Don't look at God's sanctuary, look at their sanctuary, look at what they have. Now there's so much details in this. Let me show you here, verse. 13 now. Let's move on down to verse 13, and it says this. Then I heard one saint speaking. So we just read verse 12. This is what's going on with the Antichrist power, Roman church. Then I heard a saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spoke, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host be trodden underfoot? In other words, how long are you going to let this go on, God? How long are you going to let this, this power subvert your power? Like, you've got to do something. I love what it says back in Daniel 7 when it basically just says, it, this happened, he cast truth to the ground, and he prospered against God's people until judgment came and God made things right. Here we find, God, how long are you going to let this go on? He said unto me, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I'm going to let it go on, but then I'm going to intervene. And once he says it's going to happen, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Now, most people... I've got to admit, more, majority of people, even some theologians out there, when they read the sanctuary being cleansed, has no idea what it means because they haven't studied the Old Testament because they say, that's right, it's for the Jews, it's not for us. Salvation, Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And there are they which testify of me. When he said that, what scriptures was he referring to? The Old Testament, right? You find salvation, you find Christ in the Old Testament through the sanctuary service, through all the stories in the Bible. But the sanctuary service points you to how you're saved. It tells you how, how, how we're saved, how Christ does it, right? Which is very interesting because now part of that service, system, that service is there's a day called the Day of Atonement or the day that the, the sanctuary is cleansed. Now, we're going to talk about that, okay, and, and explain that. But I'll give you a little bit of a hint. They refer to it as a day of judgment. The cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament is referred to as a day of judgment. Isn't that interesting? The reason I point that out, think about that. We went to Daniel 7. We found the little horn doing his thing. And then we find, like, God finally says, I've had enough, and judgment's going to take place. Here, the little horn's doing his thing, taking God's place as how do you get forgiven of your sins, taking, taking people's minds off of God, putting them on the, on, the, on the church, on the people on the earth, not on the heaven, getting your sins forgiven on earth, not going to heaven, not looking to God for forgiveness. How long are you going to let this go on, Lord? And he says, until the cleansing of the sanctuary. If you, understand, if you study the Old Testament, though, you understand that, that that is a term for the day of judgment interesting. It fits with everything else. So let's look at this real quick. Man, you can already see. I'm going to make those bigger for you guys. I used to put this on a great big screen. You can see it really good. You guys can't see that, can you? I mean, I can barely see it. <laughs> All right. So you follow it. In Daniel chapter 7, you had the bear, which made of Persia, and then you had the ram with the two horns in Daniel chapter 8. Same thing. Here you had Greece being the, 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 the leopard. Here you had the goat with the, with the four horns coming out of it being Greece. Then you had Rome with the legs of iron and that, and that beast power. And then what you had in the Daniel chapter 8, you had the, that little horn coming up as Rome instead of the beast power, right? And then just like the ten toes or ten divisions, you had the divisions there going taking place. But in Daniel chapter 8, you had the little horn coming up being Rome in one form and then morphing over into Rome, papal Rome, right? Just like the little horn did in Daniel chapter 7. Then in Daniel chapter 7, you had the judgment take place right after the little horn. Daniel chapter 8, what did you have after the little horn? 
cleansing of the sanctuary. So you have, then, then of course the saints possess the kingdom. So you have an order of events in Daniel 8 again. You have the little horn being pagan Rome, then it becomes papal Rome, and then he says, how long you gonna let him rule over your kingdom, Lord? How long you gonna let him just subvert your kingdom? And he says, till the sanctuary is cleansed, which parallels the judgment of Daniel 7. Everybody follow that? Same kind of timeline. God's giving us this timeline over and over for a reason. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit about the sanctuary now so we'll all get an idea of what, what we're talking about, and then we'll be able to finish. About five more minutes. Can you handle it? I can too. Can you believe we've already been here over an hour? It goes by so fast for me. All right, so here's the sanctuary. Let me, I want you to follow this. Okay, in the Old Testament, God had the people build them a sanctuary. You remember why they had the sanctuary built? Exodus, uh, uh, Exodus uh, 8, 825, is that what it is, 825? Had them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, right? God's teaching them about salvation. So you go into the sanctuary, and it only had one door. This, this, little, uh, this little thing doesn't show up, but right here in the front will be the door that you go into to get into the sanctuary. And the first thing you come to as you went into the sanctuary, you'd see the altar of sacrifice. By the way, if you're going to be saved, and you start your walk with God, the first thing you have to come to is seeing the sacrifice what Jesus has done for you. It teaches about salvation, okay? Now, this, this is pretty interesting. So you go in, you see the altar of sacrifice, and after altar of sacrifice, the next thing you would see if you're walking straight into the sanctuary, you see this laver of water, right? Which is really neat. Salvation, think about this. You walk in, you see the sacrifice, you see Jesus. The very next thing you need to do is what? Have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism. Isn't that really cool? Showing you salvation, right? But now, a lot of people think, hey, you know what? After I'm baptized, I'm done. It's over. I'm saved. Don't have to worry about anything. But that's not what's taught in this sanctuary service. It's teaching about salvation. It's not taught like that. Oh, a lot of people say it was all done at the cross. It, the, the means of salvation was all provided at the cross, but there's a process that leads to your salvation. You must accept it, right? And when you accept it, you're baptized. We're moving in that direction, okay? Now, I want you to notice here, after you, after you went to the end of the sanctuary here, the outer court, and you saw the sacrifice, you accepted Christ. Then you go to the water labor, the water of baptism. Then you go inside, isn't that beautiful? The holy place, all right? This is where the priest would go. You aren't allowed in here normally, but the priest would go in here. The holy place. And on the right side, you have the, you have the table, of, well, it's table of showbread, okay? It had two stacks of, of six on each stack, was 12, 12 stacks of bread, and the bread of life for the 12 tribes of Israel, right? The, the, representing all of God's people. The bread was there for our nourishment. You got to eat from the bread of life daily after you become a Christian. What if you don't ever eat from the bread of life after you become a Christian? Will you, will you kind of maybe starve the spiritual bread? This is everything you find in the, in the holy place is what the Christian needs as they're on their journey on their way to heaven. Okay? And so daily, you're, I got to get to that part in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So on the left, you had the candlestick, the light full of oil, the Holy Spirit, right? And the light of the world, you're the light of the world. And then, of course, right before the, um, the curtain here, you had the, you had the altar of, of incense out there before the curtain, and it would be like burning constantly, and the, and the smoke wafting up over the curtain into the most holy place in the presence of God, representing the prayers of the saints with the righteousness of Christ going up there. Everything you need as a Christian to walk toward God is found in the holy place. So you go in, accept the sacrifice. You get baptized, and then your walk to the most holy place. How many people here want to be in the most holy place with God? I want to be there, right? So on your walk, all the things you need to sustain you, you find in the holy place. And then ultimately, here we are, in the very presence of God, the most holy place. You find there the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels, the cherubim on either side, the Shekinah glory in the middle where God's at. Now, the Bible says, the Bible teaches that there was um, a day, what's called the Day of Atonement, Okay? What took place on the Day of Atonement, oh man, it, sometimes it just messes up. What takes place on the Day of Atonement, let me tell you how this works, real quick. Let's say Winston beat up his wife. Andy saw him. Winston now, the sanctuary would be, would be set out there, uh, the sanctuary is, is set out there in the middle of the desert, right? And the tribes would all camp around with the, with the priests camping closest, and then the, the tribes camping out from there. Winston, we're going to make, we're going to not make him a priest right now. He probably would have been a priest, but he's not right now. He's going to be on the back forty back there, right? And he's beat up his wife. Now he, that we would say that's sin, right? So he's got to do something to have his sins cleansed. Okay, so what's he do? Well, he gets the best lamb out of his flock, and Winston ties a rope around his neck. He starts dragging it through the camp, and it's going ba ba ba. And so Doug over here, living on the inside of the back forty, he says he looks out. Here's a lamb coming through. He looks out and he sees Winston dragging a lamb. He says, "Huh, must have beat up his wife again." Everybody knows Winston's sin. How do they know he sinned? Because he's dragging that lamb through the camp, right? So Winston drags the lamb through the camp. Bah, bah. Now, here's what's interesting. The lamb is innocent. Winston goes in through that, that door there, 
he puts his hands on the head of this lamb and puts it down real hard. And he confesses his sin to the, over that lamb, transferring symbolically his sin from himself to the lamb. But the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for your sins. So then the priest hands Linson a knife, and he cuts the throat of the lamb. And the lamb writhes in pain as it bleeds out and dies. Oh, by the way, how many people here think they would think twice about their sin if every time they did, they'd had to go take a lamb and cut his throat? You think you'd think twice about it? How much more the lamb of God? That's why it gets so aggravating when people just play down sin like it's no big deal. It's a big deal. So he cuts the throat. Now, the priest would catch some of the blood out of that lamb. Okay, I'm going to give you the short version of this. And he would, take the, he would take it and he would sprinkle it. And he would take it in the holy place and he'd sprinkle it in before the holy place, before the curtain there. Symbolically, Winston's sin was transferred from him to the lamb. The lamb's now got guilty blood. The blood is guilty. The sins are in it. He takes that blood. He sprinkles it with the sin in the holy place, symbolically transferring the sin from Winston to the lamb, from the lamb to the holy place. It's becoming defiled. You've heard the term cleansing of the sanctuary. What's the purpose of the cleansing? Well, it's being defiled. And so Winston, after he'd done that, he's all okay, right? He's, he's done what he could. He goes back, hopefully doesn't beat up his wife anymore. However, at the end of the year, on what was called the Day of Atonement, works out really good in English, at one month, something would take place. Let's read about it. Leviticus chapter 16. I know this is going too long. <laughs> but I don't know how to make it short. There are just some sermons, they just got to be long. Forgive me. If you got to get up and go to work in the morning, I understand if you got to leave. I don't know why you would, but I understand. Leviticus 16 and verse 29, it says this. This shall be the statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls. Do no servile work at all. Uh, do no uh, work at all, whether it be of your own country or a stranger or sojourns among you. Now listen to this. For on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all of your sins before the Lord. So the day of atonement, what happens? You're made clean of all of your sins. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by statute forever. The priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, he shall make atonement and shall put on the linen clothes and the holy garments. Verse 33, he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. Why does the sanctuary need atoning for? Because all year long, Winston's sin of beating his wife up all get put on the sanctuary, right? And Andy's sin of saying, yeah, I saw him do it, and he didn't really seem to do it. Lying goes on there too, because he has to confess, right? And, and my sin of gossiping, that goes on there, right? And yours, I'm not going to call yours out, right? You understand? So all these sins all year get where? Transferred to the sanctuary. That's what it says. But now it says on the Day of Atonement, he's going to make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He'll make atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, for the altar. Remember, this, it would be sprinkled on the altar, on the horn sometimes, right? He shall make an atonement for the priests and the people of the congregation. This shall be an everlasting statute to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. So what happened on the Day of Atonement? Now, the whole story, remember, they, they, afterwards they would go out and they would they, take two goats. The, 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 um, the Lord's goat would be sacrificed for that on that day. Then the scapegoat, at the, on the Day of Atonement, the priest, after he went into the most holy place to done the, done the service, the sins are now transferred, right, back to, back to him. He, he carries that out, places his hands on the scapegoat and says, you're the cause of all this, right? And a strong man takes a scapegoat out in the wilderness to go die. Okay? Now, follow this. At that moment, the sins in the sanctuary were all gone. The sanctuary was cleansed. It was done. No more sin. You follow that? But then that happened. Let's say the Day of Atonement could fall on any day. Let's say it fell on a Monday, on Tuesday. Andy comes to me, and he says, I saw Winston beat up his wife. Well, I go to Winston, and Winston said, I didn't do that. Andy lied. So now Andy has to go confess his sin. So Andy goes and gets him a little lamb. Bah, bah, bah. And everybody's looking out there and it's like, Doug looks out and says, oh, Andy must have lied again about Winston beating up his wife. Well, so Andy comes, he, he confesses his sin, cuts the throat, and the blood then is sprinkled back in the sanctuary, beginning the whole process over again. Now, that was showing us how God saves. Okay? The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that we have a high priest in heaven now right? It lets us know we have a high priest in heaven. Now, um, I'll just go ahead and take us there, because I want you to see this. 
Hebrews 9, 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What's the better sacrifice? In the heavenly sanctuary, what's the sacrifice there? Christ and his blood, right? For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So now we have a better high priest than Aaron or his sons, right? Who's our high priest now? Christ. And I want you to notice it says, he's not in the one made with hands on earth. What, what, what sanctuary is he in? The one in heaven. Okay, let me ask you this. The one in heaven, when I ask forgiveness of my sin, where does my sin go? To the sanctuary, like in the Old Testament. Christ is the one ministering as a priest in the sanctuary. Then, on the day of judgment, he goes through this and he says, okay, Philip, he, he's surrendered his life to me. My blood covers him of his sins. My blood, Father, my blood, it's taken away, right? The high priest does the work in the most holy place. On the day of judgment or the day of atonement, that takes place. And at that place, at that time when he's done, the sins are all cleansed from the sanctuary. Okay, let me ask you a question. When that's done in the heavenly sanctuary on Monday morning, is Andy going to go tell me a lie again and get, start this whole process over again? No, my friends. When it's done in the one in heaven, when that one's done there, it is done. As a matter of fact, after, oh, let me just skip over that. He said 2,300 days in shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So when, that one, when the one in heaven is done, what takes place there? Let me read it to you here. Listen to this. This text is going to make more sense to you now than probably it's ever made before in the book of Revelation chapter 22. Listen to this carefully. Revelation 22. So did that make sense? Did I describe that well enough? Same thing happens in heaven. The, our sins are transferred to the sanctuary in heaven. And then the Bible says there's a judgment or a cleansing of the sanctuary. And in 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That cleansing is going to take place. When that cleansing is done, does the sin process continue afterwards? Look what happens. Revelation chapter 22. Listen to verse 10. He said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. When does he come quickly? As soon as he makes a declaration, the filthy stays filthy, the righteous stays righteous. In other words, the heavenly sanctuary has been cleansed. There's a judgment that just took place. How do we know that? Because he makes a declaration. Righteous stay righteous. Filthy stays filthy. I'm done judging. I'm done deciding. It's done. It's over. The sanctuary is done being cleansed. And now I'm coming to get you. Behold, I come quickly. When does he come quickly? Right at the end of the judgment when it's all done. Okay? Right at the end of the judgment when it's all done. Now, here's the thing. When does that judgment begin, and when does it end? You've got to come back to find that one out. But let me show you something on the timeline. Daniel chapter 7 showed us sometime after the cross, we were going to find little horn. Then we we're going to find that he receives his wound. Then after that, sometime the judgment would take place. Daniel 8 calls it what? The cleansing of the sanctuary. Same thing as the judgment. Remember, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the judgment would take place. The people that weren't afflicting their souls, the people that weren't surrendering to God, they were going to be cut off from Israel. That's what it said in the Old Testament, they have atonement. But in the New Testament, with the sanctuary in heaven, when he cleanses that one, we don't reset on Monday. You don't start all over again. He makes a declaration and he comes quickly because it's over, right? So then the cleansing of the sanctuary takes place. And then what's next? Second coming. My friends, you and I are living somewhere around there, right around this area right here where the cleansing of the sanctuary takes place in the second coming. We're living in that time frame. But, this, but it's all good news. You know what I like about this? That's a judgment that takes place. How many of y'all ever had to go to court and be judged? Anybody ever had that happen? Yeah, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Let me tell you, how would you like it if you went to court and you found out that you're in, your, in your court setting, Jesus was your attorney, Jesus was your judge, and Jesus is a faithful and true witness? If the one that loved you and died for your sins was the one that's going to be your advocate or your, or your attorney, going to be the one that's judging you, and also the one that's the faithful and true witness, how, how good do you, I mean, that, that would be unfair. The, the, the court stacked. Everybody outside be complaining. It's not fair. He got off the hook. He had special favor. That's exactly right. And my friends, that judgment scene, as we're going to find out on the next message, that judgment scene has begun. Next message that we're going to look at, we're going to go into this timeline and find out exactly when it began. Exactly when this, thing, this whole judgment scene began. 
And we're going to find out you and I are living in the time that that judgment is taking place right now. And very soon, Jesus is going to stand up and he's going to say, it's finished. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And behold, I come quickly. My prayer is, my friends, that you're living for him now, that you'll let your sins be placed in the sanctuary in heaven. You'll call, you'll, you'll call to Christ for forgiveness of your sins. You'll plead for him to, to, to cover you in his blood so that you can be forgiven of your sins. Your sins be taken away. And when he makes this declaration, you will be clean on the day of atonement, on that day of judgment, and go to heaven. He's coming quickly, coming soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it. Lord, we tried our best tonight to make it as clear as we can. And I pray, Father, that you'll touch every one of our hearts to realize the importance of the time we're living in, that great everlasting gospel that teaches us that your judgment's taking place and you'll soon come. Lord, I pray that we'll be ready for that in Jesus' name. Amen.